Female kids, drink a beer. F*** a girl, get over it. All right, friends, hello. It's your man, Cozy Representative. In the words of Wiz Khalifa, I feel like I'm back again for the first time. How you doing? Hope you're all doing well. In the year 2003, 19 years ago, pop punk was changed forever. Pop punk, or should I say Chicago softcore, am I right? No, I'm not talking about ice cream. <laughs> I made a video which was called Exploring Fallout Boy's 90s Hardcore Roots or something like that, where I focused in on the year 1998, which saw two scrappy little vegan straight edge kids named Andy Hurley and Peter Wentz playing in goofy 90s political uh, vegan straight edge metallic hardcore bands like Arma Angelus and Race Trader. Well, Race Trader isn't goofy though, actually. Race Trader actually goes super hard. You should check out Race Trader if you haven't. They go harder than like any band that I've covered on this channel. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, so in about 2001, Arma Angelus frontman Peter Wentz was like, man, I have a broken heart, you know, I'm like kind of emotional about like girls and stuff, uh, you know, he was like, I'm getting a little tired of screaming in my forgettable D-tier converge ripoff band playing to about 20 heterosexual men every night, you know what I'm saying? He was like, I think it's about time that I start a pop punk project, you know? So one thing led to another. Pete connected with a little man with a little hat and little sideburns who had an incredible, soulful singing voice and wild songwriting talent. Now that the change has been put into motion, there's no stopping us now. And they put together a little record called Take This To Your Grave. And that record was really good. And then it blew up in the underground. And then like a couple years later, they made another record. And then that guy one got really big on MTV and on the radio. And then they got a bunch of money and they started hanging hanging out with people like Jay-Z and they started impregnating people like Ashley Simpson, but I will admit that's a bit of a simplified version of it. There's a little bit more to the story than just that. So in today's video, I, the cozy representative, hello, will be going in depth on the era of Fall Out Boy's first record, or kind of second, depending on who you ask, their 2003 debut, Take This To Your Grave, what led up to that record, what happened right after the release of that record, and we will ultimately zero in on the overall impact and legacy of Take This To Your Grave and how and why it changed the world of pop punk music forever. Also, it might be worth mentioning now, if you didn't know, that Fall Out Boy are, without a doubt, my personal favorite band of all time. Yes, it is true. Sometimes on this channel, people ask me, who's your favorite band? It's Fall Out Boy. Uh, it's always been Fall Out Boy. I bought From Under the Cork Tree around when it came out in 2005, and no joke, it changed my life. I wouldn't be here talking to you now. if Nothing in my life would be the same if I didn't buy From Under the Cork Tree back when I did, uh, and the center of my musical universe is, is still Fall Out Boy. So yeah, anyways, <laughs> without further ado, let's get into it, the Take This To Your Grave era of the, the Fall Out Boy first album. Let's go! Hey, but first, uh, if you want to support this channel and uh, throw some uh, financial support over this direction to help keep the lights on over here at the Cozy Representative Emporium, you can uh, go to the link in the description and uh, uh, become a patron and, and uh, you know, $5 a month, $10 a month. You get some uh, little bonus perk videos and such and other things. You can check out the tiers. Thank you to these people whose lovely names you're seeing on the screen right now. Uh, they're helping the cozy representatives stay afloat. 
Big thank you again to everyone who supports me on Patreon. Check out that link in the description and see what it's got to offer. And with that out of the way, onwards with the video. So let's talk about how Fall Out Boy... There's someone like walking around up there. I'm going to have to... You're going to have to be quiet. So let's talk about how Fall Out Boy formed, shall we? Uh, in the video... You're going to really have to... You're getting on my nerves, buddy. So, let's talk about how Fall Out Boy formed, shall we? In the video I made earlier this year about Fall Out Boy's hardcore roots, like I said, I talked about how Pete Wentz was the frontman, the screamer of a D-tier 2001 metalcore band called Arma Angelus. That's not my opinion, that's a fact. They were D-tier. <laughs> Uh, they put out a record called Where Sleeplessness is Rest from Nightmares in 2001, which is like such a 2001 metalcore title, uh, which was produced actually by Adam D from Kill Switch Engage, who uh, Kill Switch Engage were also a much smaller band at the time as well. That's one of my favorite little fun facts that uh, they did that record with Adam D. Anyways, and it came out on Eulogy too, pretty interesting. Anyways. In the summer of 2001, Arma Angelus needed a fill-in bass player for a summer tour, and vocalist Pete Wentz ended up courting a little 16-year-old kid who was a fan of Arma Angelus and was also a frequent showgoer in the local Chicago hardcore scene whose name was Joseph Troman. So during the summer tour, Joe Troman and Pete formed a bond, they were kicking it, they were hanging out, and Pete started expressing interest to Joe in starting, like, sort of a just-for-fun, kind-of-a-joke pop-punk side project band, reminiscent of pop-punk and skate-punk bands he grew up listening to, like Green Day, or The Descendants, or Gorilla Biscuits, that kind of thing. And the whole idea was based around the notion that Pete was a bit burnt out after years of playing in, you know, super serious, dark, uh, political hardcore bands. And he wanted to do a band that was more lighthearted and fun uh, and do something that, in Pete's words, was more easy and escapist. And uh, race trader vocalist Monty Mustofi uh, even recalled Pete telling him that he wanted to, quote, play in a band that more girls could listen to. I love that. <laughs> That's what every, like, loser hardcore guy should aspire to do. Anyways, it made Pete once a millionaire. You know, give it a try. Anyways, uh, so, <laughs> so Pete was like, you didn't think you're starting this pop punk band. Joe Troman was on board. And with that, Fall Out Boy was essentially formed in 2001. No longer can you use your Gestapo tactics to hold us down. So, although the band was still just a side project to Arma Angelus at the time, which in itself is funny that that's how that's what Fall Out Boy was at the time. Uh, Pete and Joe were fairly determined to, to get the project rolling ASAP, uh, and they began looking for other members, which initially proved to be a bit difficult considering they were still, you know, so intertwined in the, like, political hardcore scene or just the hardcore scene in general. Not many people really wanted to be in this, like, goofy pop-punk side project band. They initially actually wanted to recruit former race trader drummer Andy Hurley for the project, but he was busy with a bunch of other projects at the time, such as a local Chicago emo pop punk group called Project Rocket, uh, as well as a project actually fronted by race trader vocalist Monty Mustofi called The Kill Pill, who are a cool band. Uh, and frankly, overall, he just was uninterested in joining Fall Out Boy at the time. And it wasn't worth his time, you know. But the first member who Pete and Joe did lock down, however, was a nerdy little, tiny little dude in a cardigan sweater named Patrick Stump, who was a young teenager still in high school at the time. And as the story goes, big famous story, Joe Troman was hanging out at a Borders bookstore with a friend of his trying to classify the genre of the band Neurosis, who, if you don't know Neurosis, they were like an experimental metal band from like the 80s and 90s, and they were trying to classify the genre of Neurosis, which is so 
So nerdy and funny, but again, I love it. So they're having this conversation. Patrick Stump, this nerdy little dude who they didn't know, came over and just jumped into the conversation, eager and desperate to get his classification of the band, experimental metal band Neurosis, edgewise into the conversation. He was like, guys, what, you, what, what you're talking about with Neurosis, what kind of band they are, that, that's fucking bullshit. You don't know shit. I'm Patrick Stump. I'm like 15 or 16. I'm wearing a little cardigan sweater. Yeah, I know more about Neurosis than you guys, actually. It's basically how they met Patrick. And as the story goes, uh, the conversation between Patrick and Joe in the bookstore then led to Joe mentioning that he was starting a pop punk side project with local hardcore celebrity Pete Wentz. Patrick actually knew of Pete uh, from his bands like Arma Angelus and Race Trader. He was a fan uh, and he was immediately interested in joining this pop punk side project so interestingly enough patrick was initially interested in joining the band as their drummer as he had previously played drums in a local chicago hardcore band called patterson as well as a band called grinding process which was spelled x grinding process x because you know being straight edge was all the rage Despite this, Patrick had also given Joe a link to an account that Patrick had made on a pre-MySpace music discovery website called mp3.com, which featured recordings, home recordings, of Patrick singing and playing acoustic guitar, as Patrick was theoretically uh, interested in playing guitar in the band, if need be. So not long after Joe and Patrick's meeting in Borders, Pete and Joe came over to Patrick's house to talk to him about joining. Uh, Patrick still had every intention of joining as the drummer but joe was low-key very impressed by patrick's acoustic demos he had of him singing so joe was like hey bro how about you uh play us some acoustic guitar and you know sing us something just for fun just sing us a little song and patrick was like all right so he busted out an acoustic and started playing them covers apparently allegedly of saves the day songs off of the through being cool album Whoa, hey, hey, what can I do? Lungs are breathing open and my spleen is tripping. And basically, I mean, unlike me, Patrick had a great voice. He was naturally a good singer from the jump. You know, he was never a guy who needed auto-tune or anything like that. He was, uh, and he was actually, his vocal tone at the time was actually very reminiscent of Saves the Day's Chris Conley's voice, uh, so that was, a, you know, Pete and Patrick were like, yo, this kid kind of sounds like Chris Conley. It's kind of the type of band we're going for. Saves the day. Um, yeah, ultimately, Pete and Joe were like, fuck drums, bro. You're the singer. You got to sing. You sound like Chris Conley or little guy in a cardigan sweater. You got to front the band. Uh, and reluctantly, the young Patrick agreed and Fall Out Boy now had a singer. So before we push on into Fall Out Boy's earliest shows and earliest demos, I want to take a minute to read some quotes from an oral history about Fall Out Boy, which was published in Alternative Press back in around 2013 called Take This Back to Your Grave, where the band and many friends of the band at the time were interviewed about Fall Out Boy's early days. I actually I'm, I'm going to quote this quite a bit throughout the video because there's a lot of interesting little nuggets in there where they really explain for themselves a lot of this stuff and it puts it into a good perspective. So um, there's a couple quotes I want to focus in on right now, one being from Race Trader vocalist Monty Mustofi and the other being from Rise Against vocalist Tim McIlrath, who actually uh, he used to play bass for a brief moment in Arma Angelus. Uh, so these quotes... Uh, kind of relate to Pete Wentz's larger-than-life vision for early Fall Out Boy at the time. So Tim McIlrath says, Pete was just one of those guys who you could tell was destined for bigger things than screaming for mediocre hardcore bands in Chicago. He's a brilliant guy. Even the endeavors he took on in the microcosm of the hardcore world, he put a lot of thought into them. Monty Mustofi says, 
Pete had honed this tough guy persona, which I think was a defense mechanism. Underneath, he was a pretty sensitive and vulnerable person. He had gotten really into Lifetime, Saves the Day, the Get Up Kids, and bands like that. He was at that moment where the softer side of him needed an outlet, and he didn't want to hide behind mosh machismo. I remember him telling me he wanted to start a band that more girls could listen to. Tim McIlrath, again. Pete was telling me at an Arma Angelus practice that he was going to start a pop punk band and they would be gigantic and take over the world. He said that almost verbatim. He was dead set on that. I guess. Now, what is your mission statement? Um, Fall Out Boy, I think that at the end, when you walk away from a Fall Out Boy show, is I want you to know that that this is the most sincere moment that, that we're having as a band and that um, when you come to our show, it's an individual show and it's it's different from the last show that we had and that I think that when we get off the stage, you should understand that and you should uh, take the lyrics to mean what you want it to be, take the music to mean what you want it to be and uh, we want to, I mean, at the end of the day, before we're musicians, we're fans of music and I think that there's a lot of garbage out there and in the ca past couple years, you know, that's been, you know, building and building and I think bands like, you know, Taking Back Sunday or Newfound Glory and then hopefully even Fall Out Boy will be allowed to come to the forefront of that and kind of show people that there is an alternative and you don't have to get out there and, you know, just have this like big glitzy thing to make it good, you know, I think that you can have something honest and it can still be good. So, in Fall Out Boy's earliest incarnation, Patrick actually didn't play guitar. He just sang with Pete Wentz on bass and Joe Troman on guitar, obviously. They initially had a second guitar player uh, named John Flamandin, as well as a drummer named Ben Rose. So, they played their first show at a college cafeteria, and according to Patrick, that was their only show with John Flamandin on guitar and he hasn't seen him since. <laughs> Patrick would end up playing guitar in the interim. Uh, according to the band, the first show was quote, goofy and bad, but Joe Troman was really determined to keep the band going and was like, picking up members and driving them to practice on his own to kind of keep everyone on board and keep excitement there. <laughs> and they did not yet have a band name at this point. So, Fall Out Boy's second show, or the unnamed uh, Pete Wentz Pop Punk Side Project second show, was opening up for Rise Against singer Tim McIlrath's other band called The Killing Tree, and this is when Fall Out Boy got the name Fall Out Boy. So according to Patrick from the Alt Press Oral History, quote, we showed up late and played before The Killing Tree. There was no one there besides the bands and our friends. I think we had voted on some name. Pete said, hey, where whatever, probably something very long. And someone yells out, fuck that, no, you're Fall Out Boy. Then when The Killing Tree was playing, Tim was like, I want to thank Fall Out Boy. We all looked up to Tim, so when he forced the name on us, it was fine. I was a diehard Simpsons fan without question. So, with their new band name intact, Fall Out Boy, which at the time, Fall Out was spelled as one word, so it's Fall Out Boy, uh, the band recorded their very first demo, a cassette tape demo recorded in drummer Ben Rose's basement. This demo included three songs, Growing Up, Switchblades and Infidelity, and A Nice Myth. Uh, on the insert inside uh, the cassette tape demo, there was a lyric sheet which said the following at the top. The truth is, this was recorded on an 8-track in Ben's basement. Some of the sounds aren't the greatest, but it will give you the idea. Email us, we'd love to play just about any show. Broke Halo 7 at AOL.com or Fallout underscore boy at Hotmail.com. <laughs>
to put it bluntly, the sounds on this cassette demo were pretty rough. Uh, but there was something catchy and kind of charming about it. It's one of those things where you hear it and it's kind of goofy and it kind of makes you laugh, but you can tell uh, with a little fine tuning it could be something uh, really decent. So after this first cassette demo, the band decided to put together another demo uh, with the hope of it sounding a little tighter, so they traveled to Wisconsin to be recorded by a guy named Jared Logan, who was the drummer of uh, an old school metalcore band called Seven Angels, Seven Plagues, who Pete and the guys knew through the hardcore scene. That's a another cool little fun fact that their next demo was recorded by the guy from Seven Angels, Seven Plagues. Fall Out Boy, Fall Out Boy is a hardcore band. Little known fun fact, Fall Out Boy is a hardcore band. So, at, the, <laughs> at this time, OG drummer Ben Rose had left the band prior to this uh, second demo recording, uh, and frankly, the wind wasn't exactly in Patrick's sails when it came to his enthusiasm towards Fall Out Boy at the time. He explains further, quote, Pete and Joe decided I should play drums on the demo, but Jared is a sick drummer, so he just ended up doing it. I showed up to record that demo feeling pulled into it. I didn't really want to be in Fall Out Boy. We had these crappy songs that kind of happened. It didn't feel like anything. Joe did all of the guitars. I go in to do vocals, I put on the headphones, and it starts playing and was kind of not bad. In fact, it was pretty good, actually. I was shocked. That was the first time I was like, maybe I am supposed to be in this band. I enjoyed hearing it back. And this new three-song demo included re-recorded versions of the songs Growing Up and Switchblades and Infidelity, plus a new track called Moving Pictures. Thanks to, again, the Fall Out Boy dude's friends in the hardcore scene, the demo got heard by Pete's friend, Sean Mutaki. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, former vocalist of, believe it or not, the militant vegan straight edge band and originators of the controversial hardline movement, Vegan Reich. <laughs> <laughs> this is the singer of Vegan Reich, Sean Mutaki, uh, who now ran a label called Uprising Records, who put out releases by hardcore bands such as Race Trader, Burn It Down, and Seven Angels, Seven Plagues. So Sean Mutaki, Vegan Reich guy, you know, he liked these songs, and he agreed to release it. Uh, the demo was then released through Uprising Records as half of a split EP with a similar local pop rock band called Project Rocket, who that band, believe it or not, featured ex-race trader drummer Andy Hurley on drums. And this split EP with Project Rocket was Fall Out Boy's first official release. So, around this time, Fall Out Boy, who were still a five-piece band with Patrick just on lead vocals and no guitar, rounded up their lineup with a guy named Mike, I'm not going to get this last name right, Perescuix on drums, and a guy named TJ Racine Kunash, again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing any of that right, on second guitar. Mike on drums, TJ on second guitar. <laughs> uh, they began playing shows around around the local area, typically playing at their friends' hardcore shows in front of like 20 or 30 hardcore kids staring at them blankly and waiting for the set to be over. Sometimes they, well, a lot of times they even got heckled by these hardcore kids who they were playing for, waiting to mosh. Put your hands together, boys and girls. was one guy though however one guy in the local scene who was not only open-minded enough to accept Fall Out Boy's poppier sound but who was also genuinely into their stuff and enthusiastic about the band from the get-go and that guy was named Chris 
Gutierrez, a good friend of Pete's who actually played bass in Arma Angelus. Uh, Chris was one of the first big supporters of Fall Out Boy. So according to Pete, quote, he sold merch for us at a time when we didn't have a lot of friends who were down to do that for us. There was zero money in it at all and zero notoriety. So the next thing that happens in the early Fall Out Boy story is where the water gets a little murky and confusing and... Uh, not a lot of people really understand exactly how this went down, and it's rarely explained very well, if at all, so I'll give it my best shot. Evening out with your girlfriend. What even is evening out with your girlfriend, right? Is it the band's first album? Is it just a demo? Did it even officially come out? What's the deal? What's the what's this evening out with your girlfriend business that that we we you know that we that we that we hear very little about as Fall Out Boy fans? So after the split EP with Project Rocket came out. Uprising Records wanted the band to put together a full-length album, and Pete was also very eager to put out a full-length, or at least put out more music as well. However, the band still only apparently had those three songs, and, you know, the band in general was still very rough around the edges, and were still ultimately figuring themselves out as a band. Despite this, Uprising Records got some money together and got them back in the studio, and according to Patrick, they put together an album in, quote, like two days. So after the recording of this, you know, Fall Out Boy full length by the rough, early, five-piece, primitive Fall Out Boy, they, it was kind of like those old Simpsons uh, shorts, like before it was actually the Simpsons when they were drawn differently and it like looks weird that's like the what this version of fall out boy was it's like the the original simpsons <laughs> version of fall out boy where it looked looked weird and wasn't uh wasn't quite there yet um so anyways yeah so they recorded this album and both the band and uprising records owner sean mutaki realized that the record just kind of didn't really sound all that great. It sounded rough around the edges. It sounded rushed and sloppy. And the new drummer that they had just couldn't really keep time. He was kind of all over the place. In some ways, the songwriting was there. There were some cool ideas, but the execution just didn't do it justice. They weren't quite there yet. So uh, the band tried to stop Uprising from releasing the record. But at the end of the day, contracts were already signed with Uprising and money was already put into this thing and promises were made on Fall Out Boy's behalf so eventually Uprising did release it and I'm gonna get more into them actually releasing it in a second because that's actually kind of jumping ahead they released it later at kind of a weird time so we'll get we'll get back to evening out with your girlfriend in a moment but for right now it was recorded and the band didn't really like it so moving on between the recording and the release of Evening Out With Your Girlfriend, some pretty surprising, unexpected, lightning-in-a-bottle magic developments started happening to the little pop-punk band that could Fall Out Boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. 